Good morning and welcome to How to Write About Yourself. My name is Dante St. James. We'll be taking you through this bit of a journey on how to more effectively and more simply write about yourself. Because let's face it, when we have to talk about ourselves, for some of it's it's a little bit terrifying. So let's get that screen shared and we'll get underway. Don't forget this is a live webinar. So if you've got questions to be asking on Zoom, for those of you who have joined me on Zoom this morning, um, please do post them either in the Q&A or the chat window. I'll be monitoring both. And if you're watching this on YouTube after the fact, just pop those questions down in the comments below. And while you're there, just um, wouldn't mind it if you uh, subscribe to either my own or Business Station's channels so we can send you new material when it comes out and you'll be alerted when it becomes live. This is brought to you by Business Station and the Digital Solutions Program from the Australian Government right across Queensland, Northern Territory and Western Australia. You can watch it later on Business Station's YouTube channel or my own YouTube channel as well. In addition, uh, a little bit about me. I've done a lot of work in this area. Um, my, I guess a career as a copywriter uh, sort of began when I went into commercial radio. I started writing a lot of material, which is very short form. And then when the digital uh, revolution happened, then I found myself writing a lot of blogs and articles, stuff like that. And then being consulted a lot to write things for people. So I've done um, a lot of background in study and marketing um, and have done a lot of stuff with Facebook and do a lot of little micro credentials. And I really recommend you do this. I spend about um, about three, four hours a week doing study in something, usually through the LinkedIn platform or through the Australian Computer Society. And I thoroughly recommend you do bits of study like these kind of webinars, just a little bit every week. So you can learn a little bit more every single week towards your goals. There are a thousand people writing about your area of expertise, but there's only one of you writing about it. And that's what stops a lot of people saying, uh, why would I start writing? Why would I be the person who writes about this topic when there's a thousand other people who are writing about it and maybe far more um, better, far better at this, far more experienced at this, uh, far better writer than I am? Why would I jump in? And the answer is simply because you are the one and only you. Your perspective, your point of view, your point of difference, your particular tone, your voice, your particular set of experiences and skills are unique compared to the thousands of other people who may or may not be writing about what you're doing. I know there's about 30 billion different blogs out there that are being updated at a rate of about 3 billion a day. That doesn't mean there's not room for you. Doesn't mean that you won't see benefit from it. Doesn't mean that your blog and your articles won't contribute to your search engine optimization. So it's still very much a worthwhile thing to do. There's no calling to say that the blogs are dead or anything like that. Primarily, the web is still searched and crawled by the words on it. Uh, whilst video and audio are very important components now of search engine optimization, it's still very much about the written word. So if you don't know how to write the written word or you feel like you can't quite write about yourself, you're in the right webinar today. What we're going to look at is why it's so hard to write about ourselves. I'm going to take a little bit of a look at psychology um, and try and see the background that probably stops most of us from thinking we should be able to write about ourselves. We'll look at when you'll be needing to write about yourself online. What are the different things you may be faced with? And then a three-part formula to get it right each time. And we're online to start applying that new you. So where are we going to do it? So I've got a two very specific examples I'll run through right with you on the screen. They'll give you an idea of how to write about yourself based upon how I write about myself. People, contrary to popular belief, actually want to meet you and they actually want to buy your stuff. The idea that we're trying to sell something to people who don't want it or that we are somehow so um, horrible that no one would want to know us is a lie. It's just a lie told by a, a syndrome that I'll talk about shortly that, that stops us from thinking that anyone would have any kind of interest in us whatsoever. That people really do want to meet us. We are all fascinating people. It doesn't matter how boring your life is or how, you know, how um, eventless your story may feel, you're still a unique individual that people want to know. And then on top of that, we also want to buy our stuff. We know that because we got into our areas of business to do what we do because we saw a gap in the market before, before because we had a passion for it, because we found it useful for ourselves. So what we need to do is understand that this is true. People want to meet us. People want to talk to us. People want to buy our stuff. But we're so hesitant about it. Why? Why are we so hesitant 
to talk about ourselves. Well, a lot of it comes from childhood, like uh, so many of the neuroses in our lives, but some of it comes from culture too. The overwhelmingly Anglo-Celtic background or British values background of this particular nation means that we've sort of inherited this tall poppy syndrome. That the people who rise above the rest can be so easily cut off and we like to be able to cut them off with gossip, with innuendo, with all kinds of stuff that tells us don't stand out, don't stand up, be quiet, be humble, don't brag, blend in, don't actually stand up and be counted for anything because that's just not the Australian way or originally the British way. Notes stand out. You just do things that make you get along in life so that you just have a normal life, an eventless life, a life where you have just fit in. But you're a business owner. So those rules don't really apply to you. You're not an employee. You're a business owner. So it's actually really important for you to stand out. Yet we ask this question of ourselves all the time. Who the hell do you think you are? Who do you think you are to be the one person who stands up and makes all this noise? Who are you, the person who you know, just uh, has to go beyond the call to become something more than what you are? Who the hell do you think you are? And this little voice goes inside our heads all the time. Does it for me every time I go speaking in front of people? Does it to me every time I produce a podcast episode? It never really truly goes away. But despite the voice in your head, you can act regardless of the voice of your head. You don't have to listen to, act upon, or be restricted by a voice in your head because it is just a voice in your head. It's warning you of potential trouble you may have. But if you kind of get the idea that this is a voice in your head, it's not going to cause you trouble. It's just speaking to you in a way that's trying to get you to avoid doing something just in case you're noticed, just in case you stand out above the, you know, the, 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 the poppies of the field and you are the tall poppy. So who do you think you are? This is a thing we call imposter syndrome. And imposter syndrome is all about the idea that, well, you're not who you think you are. And you should be trying to be someone else. So how do you deal with this thing called imposter syndrome? Well, the first thing to do is to understand what it is and what it means. So imposter syndrome is where you say, you know, I feel like an imposter despite that I'm good at what I do. Or I'm qualified, but I don't feel capable. I've been successful, but I feel like a failure. Um, people like me, but I don't feel likable. Um, people think I'm attractive, but I don't feel attractive. It's this thing that says, despite what all the evidence is saying, I feel this. Despite the fact that um, I have grown this business from the ground up, I still feel like a failure and an imposter. And who the hell do I think I am to be speaking in front of people, teaching people? Who? And I, I get this all the time. Who do I think I am? And then I look back and go to that screen where it tells me all those things I've studied, all those things I've overcome, the number of businesses that I now run, the, the, the number of classes I've run in the past 12 months even, is like well over what 400 classes in 12 months, then I have to understand, oh, that's who I am. So who I think I am is irrelevant according to who I really, really am. Imposter syndrome basically is that feeling that our successes can be attributed to luck rather than our own skills or our qualifications. We didn't make it happen, luck made it happen. Am I a success? Well, that's only because I was lucky. Am I really good at what I do? Oh, it's only because everyone else is really bad at what they do. It's always looking at a but. There's always a but involved or, an or something trying to tell us that what we've achieved means nothing against the world, which is geared to just somehow trip and stumble and fumble our ways to becoming a success. We've got this idea that we're lucky. The amount of times I get told, oh, you're so lucky you get to work with all these government contracts. No, I work my butt off to get to work all these, these government contracts. Or they say, oh, it's so lucky you get to reach a, a large amount of people every week with your classes. I go, there's no luck involved. I have to keep showing up. I have to keep writing this. I have to keep making it effective. If it wasn't effective, no one would show up and I wouldn't get these views on YouTube and all that. So there's always something you need to tell yourself is, who the hell do I think I am? I'm exactly the right person to be here right now to do the thing that I'm doing. And that's the way I need to answer myself all the time. So the different kinds of um, uh, people who are imposter syndrome uh, strugglers, I guess we can say, uh, are people who are the perfectionists. So they could be those who have those ridiculously high standards. Those standards are so high that even the tiniest, teeniest little mistake or imperfection is going to make you think like you're a complete and utter failure, that nothing you're doing is ever going to be good enough. 
because you're a failure. That's the perfectionist. You might see some of that in you. I've sort of given up on the perfectionism thing because I don't have the attention span or the attention to detail to be someone who's a perfectionist. But one of the areas where I do kind of feel I fit into is what we call the superhero. And this is the, the chronic overachiever. They put in long hours. They don't take days off. They must succeed in all aspects of their life to prove that they are the real deal, that they are worthy of being the, the person who is the the, the, the presenter or the success or the person that people are saying they are. This chronic overachiever um, shows in the fact that I took a weekend off and that's my first full weekend off where I didn't work um, over the weekend. I actually just worked in uh, a five-day week last week and that to me felt overindulgent. That's when you know you're being the superhero, when you're actually not taking the time off that you actually deserve, need, the rest you need, the relaxation you need. What you're doing is instead, you know, chiding yourself for taking too much time off. Two days off in a week is not too much time. But I guess when it comes to raising a business, I'm at year six now. So I'm finally at that point where I can start to take some time to myself and step back from the business. But there's still a bit of superhero in there. The next up in the chronic overachievers is the natural genius, or what I call the Dr. Sheldon Cooper effect from the Big Bang Theory. These are people who are used to things coming quite easily, being able to master almost everything on their first try. And if they do something which they don't master in the first go, they don't get it perfectly right in that first try, then they feel like they've somehow failed. They feel like that they are a failure, that they're an imposter, and they're not who they think they are, or they're not who people outside of themselves think they are. When things come easily to you and you haven't had to work very hard for them in your life, then you might feel that you don't really deserve this. It's just momentum or something else that's got you to the point where you can you know, get to being able to do that sort of stuff. This is to do with you know, the geniuses. We know them. We've probably got some in our families, people who are so good at everything naturally that they avoid the things they know they're not going to be good at because it, it blows their self-esteem out of the water. Then there's also the soloist. This is the person who does not exactly play well with others. They don't like to ask for help because asking for help makes them feel like a failure or a fraud because they've painted themselves in a corner of thinking they are somehow um, shouldn't require help because they should be good enough at this to not need help at any stage. A soloist really struggles with going to someone saying, hey, I don't know how to do this. And these are the people who can cost a lot of money in training. Uh, they can cause a lot of problems when they're very early into a job or early into a business because they don't reach out for help. They don't get the advice because they feel that they should know this by now. This is particularly fraught with problems when you're a second or third time business owner and you think, yeah, I know all this. I've done all this before, but you realize that your last two businesses failed and this one hasn't. So this is the person who doesn't really seek help um, because they feel like to do so would make them a fraud, would make them an imposter. And then there's the expert. This is the person I suffer from this one horribly. The most certified and most credentialed person in the room, they are always seeking out additional badges or certificates because they feel like they'll never, ever know enough to be truly qualified to be doing the thing they're doing. Um, you just take a look at my LinkedIn profile and I'll show you how much of a, uh, an expert that I like to think that I am. It's just going in there every week and spending hours studying, getting badges, putting those badges on my profile, making sure it's known that I've got those badges just so I can feel like I'm doing something in this realm and I deserve to be doing it. Otherwise, I feel like a fraud and I feel like a phony when I step out, step out there and don't have these things backing me up. It feels like I don't deserve it, even though I've done countless hours of study and work to get to this place. So the whole thing of conquering this imposter syndrome, it's not something that happens easily. Um, I didn't really conquer it probably until early 2020 after I'd done some pretty health, pretty, pretty serious self-development work. And it was at that point where I stood up and said for the first time in my life, wait a minute, you are the expert in the room. You are the one who knows what they're doing. Um, why are you allowing yourself to be convinced otherwise? And it took some time. It took a lot of practice of just getting up there and doing the thing, getting up there, doing the classes, doing the advisory sessions, getting success, getting feedback that's good. And then a lot of self-talk, actually talking to myself every day. And you'll do the same thing. You'll talk to yourself every day with some kind of mantra or some kind of idea that tells you, I am the expert in the room because I've worked bloody hard to get here. 
And that's what my one is. It's I am the expert in the room because I've worked bloody hard to get here and I've got the track record to prove it. And that's what I have to say to myself in some form or shape every time before I sit down and write something about myself, every time I send out a bio to be in a speaker gig, or if I even sit down to do a class like this, I need to remind myself, I know what I'm doing. I know what I'm saying. I know who my audience is. I know that I'm saying the right thing and leading them in the right direction. So this is the kind of stuff you may need to go through before you even start to write anything. You'll get to that point where you go, I need to prove who I am first. Then I can spread that word that I spread or give that message I'm going to give. So why you need to write about yourself is basically comes down to the fact that you're a business owner and nobody else is going to blow your trumpet for you. The world has changed drastically. It's no longer a world where sitting back and just letting people come to you because you happen to have a shop front with a sign on the street. That doesn't work that way now, especially in a digitally enabled world where most of our businesses that are new these days don't have a shop front. They may not even have an office. They'll actually, like I'm in my living room this morning because I've got meetings that are nearby to here that I need to be able to be close to. So I'm not even in my office today. The world has definitely changed. We're a lot more flexible. We're a lot more time sensitive. We're a lot more, you know, less likely to want to be locked in a cubicle in an office and more wanting to be able to move about, have a meeting in a cafe like I had this morning and like I'm going to have at lunch today. Those kind of things. That world changing means that we need to look at things in a different way because every business, according to Gary V, is now a marketing business. Or as he likes to say even more so, that every business is now a media business. We need to be masters of our own media, masters of our own message, the ability to be able to put out a message that lets people know who we are, what we do, and who it's for. So that the right customer knows us when they see us. And then also to be in that place where we want people to know us, like us, and then trust us enough to be able to buy something from us. And in the digital world, this is probably more fractured than ever before. We used to be able to pay TV stations and newspapers and put pins on board and, and give credit, give not credit cards, and loyalty cards and business cards and magnets on fridges to achieve all this. These days, though, it's a little bit different. What we're looking at now is having to market ourselves, write about ourselves, talk about ourselves. So once we get past all that imposter syndrome, we then have a situation where we simply must be able to talk about ourselves because people are already talking about us regardless. It comes in the form of um, reviews and recommendations and word of mouth as well. People are talking about us whether we want them to or not. People are talking about us whether we know it or not. It's all happening out there regardless of what we may think about ourselves. So if the narrative is being is taken control of in your story by others that are outside of your business, it would be nice to sort of bring that in-house and take a little bit more control of what's going on out there. That the brand, which is basically what people think about your business when you are not around, your brand is then securely put in a place where you have some kind of say in what people think about you and your brand. Secondly, your silence says more about you than you realize. It's like when an allegation is put forward on a business or a government and they're saying, oh, um, we contacted this particular business, but they had no comment. That implies guilt and it implies that they have nothing better to say and they have no defense. Silence says more about you than even you saying something yourself. And we find this in areas like, so, say, um, crisis communications, where there is uh, a crisis happens around a business. It could be a reputational crisis. It could be a product crisis. It could be the fact that you haven't delivered any work for weeks and people are starting to say things about you. And then you don't actually have anything to say about that. You have no, um, no sort of uh, comeback. You don't have any words that you can tell people about you being someone who um, was able to do this or do that, or you don't have any defense to the allegations they're putting out to you. So you just go silent, you shut everything down and you just don't talk about it. That's where things can go horribly, horribly wrong. And people will take the story into their own hands. They will start to paint a picture and tell a story that probably isn't true and at, at, at best and at worst is grossly against everything you stand for. The other thing is too is that this whole idea of people being like uh, humble about themselves and talking themselves down and that, it's exhausting and it's boring and we're sick of it. 
as consumers, we don't have time for your humility. We don't have time for you to sit back and go, oh, I don't really feel comfortable doing this. The consumer doesn't care whether you feel comfortable about it. They just need to hear what you're about, whether your product is great and whether it's good for them. If we stand and go, oh, I don't really like to advertise. I don't really like to talk about myself all that much. Oh, it just feels a bit bad. The consumer is just like, oh, for goodness sake, just stop. I don't really have the time to deal with this because all it's making me do is go, oh, this is so awkward. I don't want to brag. I don't like talking about myself. Oh, that's enough about me. I've talked about myself too much. It comes across as false humility. It doesn't feel real because we expect a business owner of all kinds of people in this world, like a politician, to be able to talk about themselves, to be able to at least communicate who they are and what they're about, what their story is and why it's a good idea for them to build this. Yes, we don't like being badgered when we walk into a shop, but when we do walk into a shop and need some help from someone, we want to know that they're able to actually sell the item and tell us why we should buy it because that's the exchange that happens between sales rep and a person or business owner and client or consumer or customer. So where are the places do you feel that you may, may need to write about yourself? There's a number of them I'm going to list here that makes it sort of shine to you why you need to. Like in websites, for instance, websites are essentially all about you and your customer. So we can do things like the story brand process from Donald Miller's building a story brand series, which helps you to identify what your customer wants and how to then be able to speak into the, the, the world that they live in rather than you just saying, we're great because of this. Websites also have areas like, for instance, your about section. So about our business, about me as a business owner, things like sales copy, which is not just you talking about yourself or writing about yourself, but it's also you writing about your products and your services and your business and your employees and all that sort of thing. Your homepage is you writing about yourself. Now, admittedly, your homepage should be within the context of the problem that your customer wants to solve. So it actually speaks to their problem or their experience, but it is essentially all about you. Your product pages and recommendations, they're all about your product. So if you're writing something in there, you say, oh, look, I don't feel comfortable claiming this is a really good product because that's you not being able to take control of the idea that your product is great. And if you don't think your product is great, no one else should be expected to think your product is great and buy it either when you make recommendations of different things, such for instance, if you like this particular moisturizer, you'll love this, um, this chemical-free toner as well. If you can't speak confidently about those things, there's no reason for anybody to feel even the slightest bit confident and comfortable buying your product. Your team pages are where you may be talking about members of your team or probably yourself if you're a sole trader. And this is where if you have a really poorly written about me section or about me page, it can be really, really awkward. And it doesn't feel like I can, I'm inspired with confidence to deal with this person, this brand or this particular company. I've got a bit of an example that we'll go through towards the end of this webinar, which will show you the process of writing an about page because that can be a really hard deal breaker for some people who just go, I can't write about myself. It feels ridiculous. And I admit it does sometimes feel a little ridiculous. Let me just quickly refresh my page because I've just um, lost my internet connection during that at some point. And I'll just be able to present this again and get us going. Sometimes um, Canva likes to uh, be a little bit misbehaving. So we go forward into our right place. Nearly there. And here we are. So from websites, then we move on to things like quotes and proposals. So this is where you're, for instance, making a quote for your business, for your services, where you're putting a proposal in to be able to take on a body of work from a customer, a government organization, another company, whoever it happens to be that you deal with. Quotes and proposals need to be written in a bit of a different way. You're not really telling a story so much, but what you may need to do is have some very good company information on there, who we are. But as part of the whole thing, um, that whole three point um, customer experience, which is to do with the customer first, knowing who you are, then liking you, and then trusting you. A quote assumes that if they've asked you to quote for something that you already are known, you may already be liked, they're now wanting to know that they can trust you to deliver the, pro the, the project or the, uh, the products or the services 
in a correct time, in a correct way, and within a price that they feel is reasonable for your services. So this is right at the end of the, the customer journey and sales funnel, which goes, all right, this is where we need to adequately explain who we are, what we do and who it's for. And in some way, tell a story that makes someone feel confident that we've not only done this before, but we've done it really well and we've done it within budget. LinkedIn is pretty much a, an exercise in talking about yourself. For example, your LinkedIn profile will have a profile description about you. This is where you actually have to talk about yourself. There's an idea of saying who you are and what you do and who you might, well, and what you might be looking for in LinkedIn as well. Because LinkedIn quite often is used as a big online resume where people are looking to hire you for things. Um, every two or three days, I've got somebody reaching out asking me to apply for a particular role. Um, I'm not looking for employment. So I mean, it's not something that appeals to me. But if I was someone who was um, looking to get work or looking for customers to look to me as a possible solution to the problems they're having, then I'd want to make sure that that's abundantly clear in my profile description of who I am. In your posts on LinkedIn, whether you are a creator or whether you are a business owner or you're using a company page or your personal profile to post things, this is a place where you do need to be very, very sure about who you are so that when you're communicating, it comes across clearly and concisely and convincingly that you are who you are. Your business is who it is and you're able to solve a specific problem for your customers. There's also the ability to write articles in LinkedIn and live video. Um, I just got my live video clearance with LinkedIn in the past uh, week and a half. So I'm putting together a plan of how I can do live videos on LinkedIn to further explain that question of talking about myself, what I do and how I solve it so that others can learn what that is, but also so that potential customers can see that I'm not just confident about what I do, but I'm confident enough to be able to communicate it on a live video platform as well. So these are other places where you could be faced with having to talk about yourself. Then there's other social media. We're talking about Facebook, Instagram, um, Pinterest, wherever social media may be. And these have the same kind of thing that you're going on with LinkedIn. You're going to have a profile description of some sort or a company page or a business page where you need to explain who you are. Your posts are going to be about you and your, and your, your business and what you sell, your products and services. And they're going to be different posting strategies around that. And there's plenty of different... Um, you know, uh, digital solutions, webinars that can talk to you about that. But then there's also articles and live video, all the same things that we had in LinkedIn, but they might be towards less of a business customer and more of a consumer who may be looking at your material for the first time online. In addition to social media, this is one that comes up quite frequently for me. It's a bio for speaking gigs. So if you um, tend to be found that people will ask you to speak at an event or you might have been called up for a TEDx conference or something like that, or perhaps you've been um, asked to come and speak at a club dinner, anything like that, having a bio that explains who you are so people who are going to book to go to that event will know who you are and what you're about. So your bio for speaking, and we're going to do an example of one of these before the end of the webinar, will contain a little bit of stuff about you. So a little bit of a story about you, the experience you've had as a public speaker, what your past speaking gigs were and how they were received and what you speak about. What's your area of expertise do you happen to speak on? Is it inspiration? Is it business oriented? Is it business growth? Is it about a specific kind of system that you may be an expert in? Or is it talking about um, how to be a better something, how to apply this life lesson to your life? Whatever that particular thing is, needs to be part of your bio. And that is writing all about yourself. So this writing about yourself thing all comes down to like most things in life some kind of formula that can make it a lot easier so you don't have to sort of stress about it so much and so that you can very easily replicate this again and again and again because you will not be asked just once to write about yourself you'll be asked to write about yourself for the rest of your business life and even if you quit business and go back to full-time work, you still have to write about yourself in a resume and a cover letter as well. So this can be a valuable tool to help you to do that. So the three steps we're looking at to writing your own stuff, we're going to start off with the first one being your objective. What do you want to gain from this? What is it you want to actually get at the end of this? Is it um, to convince people? Is it to convert customers? Is it to get people to book you? Is it just a bit of brand awareness? Then we look at who the target reader is. 
who's the most likely person to be reading this particular piece of writing or an article. And then finally, we'll look at the structure, how to start and then fill out and end your about us area. So it could be that, or it could be how to fill out your, your bio about you as a public speaker, or how to write about your business in some kind of structure. And there's lots of different methodologies that follow this. And we'll look at a couple of them, but I'll tell you about a few others as well. There's a storytelling technique, uh, which I've done very recently. I think it was last week on a webinar. So if you're looking for that, just look for me on YouTube and you'll see it on my channel. You'll be able to see uh, what that particular one is. I think it was writing for Google searches. So that's another kind of structure you can look at as well when you're writing about yourself or your products. But first of all, we'll think about the objective. An objective is a fancy word. I wish I had changed that. What's your goal? What's your goal of doing this? What are you, what's your motivation? Why are you wanting to write about yourself? Are you trying to sell something? Are you looking to express your expertise? Are you looking to introduce yourself to a bunch of people who've never heard of you before? Are you a new person in a group? Or are you a part of a club that they require you to have a profile for your business? So how do you write about that? Think about first what you want to gain out of writing for yourself. And if it's as simple as to get this piece of work from a customer, that's what we start with. Then after that, we move on to who we're writing it for. Are they corporate government, parents, consumers? Are they customers? Are they 45-year-old men? Are they 27-year-old women? Are they employed, unemployed? All the little things about demographics that tell us who your customer is and gives us an idea of the kind of person we should be writing for. And this is where we do ask the question of, you know, what's the education level? What's the English literacy level of people that are going to read this? And I always say the greatest rule of all is to rather than being clever with words and playing with words, be super clear. Don't sort of wrap yourself up in fanciness because nobody's impressed by it. When we're searching online, particularly in digital platforms, we're looking for easy answers to our complex questions. So the easier and the quicker you can answer that question, the more likely that people and Google are going to bring you into their day. Once we know who we're talking to, then we look at some kind of structure. So are we writing a resume, uh, an about page on a website? Are we trying to uh, put an estimate to someone to tell them how much it's going to potentially cost them to get this done if they work with us? Or are we responding to tenders, that whole industry around people who respond to tenders and write grant applications. So that is all about writing about yourself as well. So an example we're going to use straight off the bat is all about the idea that we're going to um, figure out what our goal is. And then we're going to look at who the reader is and then what the structure is that we may want to choose for that. So that's the objective, the target, and the, 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 the format that we're looking at. So I've just made it a bit of easier language, the goal, the reader, and then the structure. So if we then paint that out and say, my goal is to fill out the about page on my website. And my reader is a potential customer of my writing business. So I'm just, I'm actually starting up a separate copywriting business. So this is actually very relevant for me um, as a so as aside from my digital marketing business, because there's now a gap in market where I am, where there's someone who's looking for much, much more copywriting. So I'm going to bring on other copywriters and bring them into a copywriting agency for small businesses. So yes, the reader is very much a potential customer of my writing business. And then the structure of this is going to be, it's going to be friendly and personal um, and leads them to wanting to learn more about you. So this is going to be a lot to do with your, your values as a person and your values as a business. So when I walk into any sort of environment uh, to do a business, I want to make sure I show up in a certain way. I want to make sure I'm showing up as authentic. I want to show up as, as, as vulnerable. And I also want to show up as effective. So authentic, vulnerable, effective. I want those three things that always shine through in everything I do. So for me to be friendly and personal, that, that leads up to the, um, and the other word was approachable. So that begins to be approachable and I'm vulnerable. So I need to get vulnerable in order for people to feel connected enough to be able to then move on to like me and trust me enough to do work for them. Because ultimately I want them to learn more about the products and services I provide. But I first need, need to get them to know who I am, and to like me before they will trust me to deliver that work. So then we lay this out further, the goal, the reader, the structure. 
as uh, the content for the about page, we know that's what we want to do. So we're going to work on that. We know that we're writing it for a potential customer of a writing business. So part of this needs to showcase some of the style of my writing because every sort of word that's going to be on this website is going to be judged closely by the customer who wants to get me to write things for them. Then when we look at the structure, that friendly personal wanting to lead them to know more means that I need to introduce something about myself. It is it's unavoidable that in my, my own personal values of approachable, um, you know, um, authentic, uh, effective and vulnerable, I need to be doing something that introduces myself. I can't avoid it because I need to match that with my values. Otherwise, I'm not going to feel like I'm very authentic in my business. So I introduce something about myself and then have some kind of call to action to go to the next step, which is what I want them to do. I want them to want to learn more or book a time with me or to book a chat with me or something like that. So then once we've done that, those three steps, we work out then how to write the actual thing. And the writing is all about getting in, telling a story, and then getting out. That's a really easy way. Get in, tell the story, get out. Most people have got the story mostly handled, but the, how to start talking and how to get out of talking to the next thing, that takes some skill. And this is like the same as a speech. People who've never written speeches before tend to waffle. They don't know how to end the story. They don't know how to, what their punchline is at the end. All they know is that here's all the things I want to say, but they haven't thought about how do I start it? And then how do I call it an end and actually end this in a really good way? That's kind of like life, really. We, we get into a business, we know how to start it, we know how to run it, but how do we end that business? How do we retire from it? How do we sell it? We don't often plan ahead for that. So getting in is all about some sort of thought provoking or hook or a teaser that drags someone in and makes them go, oh yeah, I want to read more about this. Then to make it really, really easy because we as humans can only really take in so many ideas at once. I like the idea of three points or three ideas that you can explore in the story. So three things that back up um, the story of you and your business or you and your life or whatever it is and gives you some kind of um, satisfaction for the, the, the hook that you had to bring people in. If you're promising a great story and you don't tell a great story, you're disappointing people and there's no reason for them to want to work with you. Sadly, people are not just going to work with you because you're good at it. You need to be able to express that you're good at it as well. Otherwise, they've got no reason to trust you. They don't have a lot of things to, to work from apart from testimonials and your own story to be able to base their decisions to work with you upon. And then finally, to get out some sort of concluding thought and some kind of call to action to do more. Even at the end of a best man's speech at a wedding, you'll have a funny anecdote that's told with an ending that makes people laugh. And then the call to action is usually now raise a toast to the groom or raise a toast to the bride or whatever it is the best man does. I don't go to a lot of weddings because I don't like them. But it's, it's, it's that whole idea that there has to be something next. What is the next thing you want them to do? Remember, you had an objective, you had a goal to go somewhere. So now we need to apply that in what we're writing. So if I was to write this particular story, let's see how it will play out. This is my writing business. So I start off with that thought-provoking teaser that hooks you in. So it starts off with a story about me. Me getting vulnerable and getting authentic means telling a story about me. So I say, given my struggles with cursive writing and some very interesting ways to avoid spending any kind of time sitting down, no one could have told you that writing would one day be not only my passion, but my career as well. So that's immediately saying, ha, we're going to hear a great story here. And it's just a very brief, very small sound bite that can be used to drag someone in to go, yep, I'm going to read this because there's a story to be had in here. Then the second level is telling that story, exploring what it is about that story in three points or three ideas explored in the story. So in my case, I'm going to look at, we, I've had the promise in that, in that first slide here. I was talking about that there's struggles in there. I've talked about that I had some issues with cursive writing and avoiding sitting down. And then now that writing is a passion and a career, I need to address that in the story. So I'm going to talk first about my early struggles with cursive writing and with attention to detail. Uh, I wasn't an ADHD kid, an ADHD kid, not that we didn't have a name for that when I was growing up, but um, I definitely wasn't that. I just was bored at school because 
I felt like everything we were teaching was pointless. And when I found finally things I could actually attach myself to, then the story of my writing began and I became such a massive lover of words. So I look at what my early struggles were. That's the, that's the sort of the, the, the hero's journey of I've, I've hit an obstacle in life. I'm a bright, vivacious kid who just struggles to write. And then the next page of the story is discovering that love of words, where that change happened, where that point of inspiration, that lightning bolt moment came in that said, ah, now I found a reason to sit down, shut up and learn cursive writing because I found that I wanted to share stories. And then finally, we look at that, the, the third stage of that, that we got through the struggles, we found the love of words, we found a reason to push through and learn how to write. Now, finally, turning that love of words into a career, into a job, into a business, into a, whatever that part of the story is. This means a much more personal story that appeals to the human in your customer, not just a story of we've been writing copy for 25 years and have written for some of the biggest names in Australia and small businesses as well. It's that's just so boring. They could read that off anything. They could just read that off the front page of your website or anywhere. But if you want to go and actually tell a story, have an about page that tells a story. And that story is basically how you came about your business. It could be that you started working with coffee because you're someone who went out and was sick of having terrible coffee in, in corporate meetings. You decide to set up a business that, that, that provides coffee to corporate meetings and conferences that is actually good and tasty and is also organic. And it suits all these stories where you go, I used to go to conferences and hate coffee. Now, um, so I decided to do something about that. But first of all, I had to find a way of getting really good tasting coffee to massive of people in a very short period of time. In a one hour lunch break, you don't want people lining up for half an hour just to get their coffee. So you need a way of getting great coffee into people's hands quicker than possible. Then we found this way of doing it, which allowed a little bit of self-service and a little bit of guidance to get that perfect coffee every time. And then we turned it into a business and we've now got franchises all around Australia. That is far more interesting than that. We make coffee for conferences so that your people aren't standing around waiting all day to get a first cup of coffee and getting angry at your conference. You've got a far more immersive reason for someone to believe in what you do. You want somebody to look at that and go, oh my God, these guys are brilliant. I wish I had a thought of that. And they, 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 will, they will say, geez, there's, there's like a million dollars in every idea out there. Why didn't I think of that one? Well, I've lined up at conferences myself. And conference organizers who you'll be selling this product to are going to be people who you go, wow, why didn't we think of that? We should get someone like that. That's the kind of person we want to work with. And if you're that person, if you're selling that coffee service, then you want the person who's reading to think that. So you're not going to get that by, we don't want people lining up for coffee. You'll get it by appealing to the human in the person reading. And the human in there has lined up too many times for coffee, hates having bad coffee just because they're in a public space and really hates waiting and thinks that they should be able to get a good coffee in a much faster way. So the telling of the story is basically three steps. Early struggles, when the change happened, and then the story of turning this into a thriving business. And that's showing not only a story, but it shows that you've had growth. It shows you come from humble beginnings and come through to be a success now. It's convincing someone in your own words and your own story that not only is what you do a good idea, but you've proven it's a good idea by being able to turn an idea into a business. So this applies to almost any kind of business you're gonna be running. You can tell that story. So those three points, don't try to overdo it. Don't try to write 100,000 words on a screen. You don't need that much. A simple, basic story will do. And then finally, with our story, with our, with our story about writing about ourselves, we have to find a way to get out. How are we going to end this? And this is where we put that concluding thought and a call to the next thing or a call to action as it's usually called. So I can say in my particular case, while the direction our lives will take is not always clear, the message and purpose in your writing should always be, get in touch today and let's talk about how words can bring your products and services to life. So I started off with a concluding thought that was actually kind of clever. I went, you know, while the direction we take in life, because I'm talking about the fact that I started off nowhere near being able to write to being then a, quite a master of writing, then I said that that may not be clear, but your words always should be. So there's a clever little play on words that I did there, which isn't too over clever. It doesn't make people just go, what is he talking about? It actually is really abundantly clear. And then the call to action, which is get in touch today. 
So I was able to then tie it into what it is I do. So this can happen then with anybody. So let's go back to the coffee example where the person has got that, that conference coffee service. Let's just say that they were, their concluding thought is something like, um, thankfully you don't have to line up in a line, uh, you don't have to line up in a, in a queue to get, um, to get a great idea on board and, and achieved in your life. Thankfully, um, our idea was as good as our coffee and we're glad to have been able to produce it for thousands of people every single year. So your next step is to fill in our form below and let us know you're interested in having us bring our coffee to your venue. So that could be then a little bit of a concluding thought that's saying that, you know, that, that sometimes there's brilliance in very small ideas and now the call to action, what we actually want to do. That goes back to remember the objective. We want to get people to talk to us. We want to get people to learn more, do more, do something, book us, uh, buy our products. So that kind of convincing message has to contain um, not just a concluding thought, which makes your whole story make sense, but then gives you a smooth run out to actually an ask for the sale or ask for the click or ask for the details on the form. So that would be one example. Another example we could give for this could be in a, another business, which is looking to write a bio about themselves for a speaking opportunity. So I know this is very niche, not everyone's gonna be doing public speaking, but just bear with me on this one, because it's a bit different than someone who is doing writing. This is about someone who's speaking for, a, for their business. And if they had trouble, and this happens so many that times that people who are really good speakers, don't necessarily know how to write about themselves. They know how to talk about themselves, but how to put that on paper is a whole different deal because literacy is very different to mastering a language. You can speak a language, you can learn a new language. For instance, I've tried to learn Mandarin before and I got a few words and phrases in, but without any sort of written down version of this that I can understand, I having to look at Mandarin text, um, completely looks like garble to me. So I couldn't make that connection. So I kind of gave up on it. So my next step is to look for a language that I can learn that uses the Roman alphabet as basis and that it will also be useful for me as a business owner. So I'm actually trying to starting to settle upon uh, Bahasa. So what's spoken in Indonesia and Malaysia uh, because you know Indonesia is one of the world's biggest countries in terms of population. So I want to be able to take advantage of that. And plus our connection, I live in Darwin. I'm really close to Indonesia. It's just up the, up the road. So I want to be able to be able to speak the language of the people there so I can grow my business there one day. So let's just say you're looking to write a bio about yourself for a speaking opportunity at, at, at a conference. Your reader is going to be that person who is looking for someone who's interesting. So when they're looking for something industry, they're looking for some kind of hook, some kind of thing that's going to make, oh, this person's going to be great in our lineup. So your structure for this this time is going to have to be compelling and interesting and convincing. You need to be able to tell someone that you have a story to tell. It's a good, interesting story to tell. And you need to be convincing enough for them to want to go, yeah, this is the person I want to have speaking in my conference. So your goal to write a bio about yourself for a speaking opportunity, your reader, someone looking for that interesting speaker, they know they've got many choices. So you need to be able to have your particular bio stand out from the crowd. You're not going to be able to fall back on just any old words. You're going to have to look at something which makes you stand out. So you're going to have to use a structure that number one makes you stand out, makes people know who you are in those words, but also helps them to like you and finally, to trust you to deliver an amazing speech. So how do you do that? Let's start off then by looking at the get in, tell the story and get out method. So if we get in, we're looking at a thought provoking teaser that hooks you in. Again, telling the story, this time we're gonna look at those three points, but we're doing it within the context of wanting to get someone to know you, like you and trust you. And then finally in getting out, yes, the same, concluding thought and a call to action. So what does this then start to look like? When we want to get in that thought-provoking teaser that hooks you in as a speaker could be after spending a decade studying to be a doctor, the last thing you'd expect is for them to use their skills to write radio ads and fill in for sick presenters on the weekends. Now that's a start of a story. That's about me so because I'm better at writing about me than I am writing about anyone else because I know my story. So that tells me that someone studied to be a doctor and then became a radio presenter. What the hell happened there? What did he do to not be a doctor anymore? And so it forms questions and that's what you want to do. You want to have something which hooks someone's in and goes, oh, I need to read more about this because I'm quite fascinated about what happened. 
And then in the story, I get to tell that story. I get to tell what happened. So in those three points of getting to know them, like them and trust them, I tell the story of the early struggles I had with medicine. Then I also introduce the positive outcome of that. There's something that even though I struggled with that, then there was a positive story at the end of that. And, and just as a spoiler, I didn't kill anyone. So don't, don't think that. It's definitely not that. And then we look at backing up that with testimonials for others. This follows the know them, like them, trust them. The know them comes from telling the stories of the early struggles. So someone knows you, that means that you've got some kind of empathetic connection with them. You can feel like what it means to be in their shoes because they've told you about a struggle. It's why movies always start off with someone in a happy place who suddenly has a happy thing removed from them. So they have some sort of massive challenge or disaster happens. So you feel empathy for that person. The same goes for your writing. You tell the stories of these struggles at the beginning simply because you want someone to know who you are and feel connected to you. So then they have the chance to like you when you tell them, oh, but it all worked out fine because this, 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 and this. And then you're able to say, oh, the positive outcome. So now they like you because you're able to overcome whatever that struggle happened to be. And then finally, we back it up with a testimonial. So we start to say, particularly in speaking, this is where you can say, and it doesn't have to be just speaking, it could be anything, it could be a, a retail store, but something that says, this is why we were voted favorite coffee shop of the year by um, people in Mackay. Or you could say, this is why um, Jan from, from the um, Adelaide Entertainment Center said that they gladly have me have us back again because we're able to provide not only a great story, but laughs in the crowd that, that, fueled, that fueled people to want to learn more. So those kind of things that tie into whatever you're doing, in this case, getting a speaking gig, um, the know you comes from feeling something for you. The like you comes from being able to be give, given a, a happy ending to the story and a really positive twist. And the trusting you comes from either producing examples of your work or by producing testimonials that people have written about you. So there's tons and tons of these different ways that people can uh, have you express why they should know, trust, and like you. And that's a really good method for writing about anything is that basically in a, in, a, in a business, you want someone to know you, like you, and trust you so that they will become a customer and start throwing money at you. And let's face it, in business, we all want to have money thrown at us. The get out in this case, in that concluding thought and call to action, um, can be in a writer, in, in a speaker's way. It could be for anyone who feels like they've peaked way too early in life. This is a story jam-packed full of inspiration and uh, it's never too late message. Book Dante now at dantesandjames.com. So that's where you get to sort of give that, this is who it's for. So now go and book this person. So that's the kind of thing that comes in my own speaking bio. It's not on my website as a speaking bio, but that's the speaking bio that I generally send out to people in a way that makes them feel like they can connect, they can like, and then they can trust. So your takeaways today from, I guess, of how to write about yourself is, yes, it is hard to write about ourselves because we've been kind of trained in life to think that it's a bad thing. It's somehow self-absorbed or selfish. Uh, talking about ourselves is painting ourselves into a tall poppy corner that we're ready to be cut down by people. So that fear is then is overcoming that fear. We want to make sure that we overcome it because at some point, and that's takeaway number two, you're going to have some kind of reason or some kind of motivation to actually have to talk about yourself or write about yourself on various ways, whether it's on websites, whether it's on speakers' bios, whether it's on the LinkedIn profile or on your Facebook profile. At some point, you have to say something about yourself or your business. Third takeaway is that there are several formulas for writing about yourselves. So some of those can come in the format of um, the... I can't remember his name now, but the, there's a story a storytelling guide. Um, Park Howell is his name. Park Howell, H-O-W-E-L-L, -L, has some really good uh, has a really good book that tells you about how to write about your brand um, in a way that's a, a storytelling process. Another um, way you can look at it is through the Building a Story Brand book by Donald Miller, which actually helps you to be able to write for customers on things like websites. It's very sales oriented and gives you a structure with which to not just understand your customer, be able to present your products and services to them in a way that makes sense in their lives. So those tons of different formulas in there. We actually had a look at some of those formulas, but we understand that we need to start with our goal. 
with what our objective is. Then we need to know who our reader is. So we know who, how to pick a formula that suits them best. So we're writing something that makes sense for those particular people. So would you like to dig more into storytelling with a guide who can help you get there? I'm not the only storyteller on the Digital Solutions Program, but I'd love to spend some time with you. If you've got um, those, that three hours you may have uh, banked up or you may not have even used or you don't even know what I'm talking about, it's all part of the Digital Solutions Program. And in that Digital Solutions Program with Business Station, you for $44 can get three hours one-to-one -one with myself or other advisors on the program. There are dozens of us. So um, there's two of us in the Northern Territory if you're on in the NT, um, so we can see you in person if you're in the Darwin region. Uh, but if you are outside of there in Western Australia or Queensland or even beyond, there's other digital solutions programs around Australia as well. It gives you then unlimited access to workshops and webinars. Ignore the four hours in there. You can actually access as much as you like. You can register yourself at businessstation.com au and that will help you to get your self set up so you can make that decision to be better at writing about yourself on digital platforms if you'd like to keep in touch with me please do feel free to send me an email dante at clickstarter.com.au or dante at businessstation.com.au these days or look for me on linkedin facebook or instagram linkedin is where i'm much much more active and i'm on there all day talking to people. So I'd love to be able to connect with you and have a conversation there too, and give you some tips along the way through my webinars, classes, and posts on how you can write better as well. In the meantime, though, I'd like to thank you for joining me and taking an hour out of your business to work on your business. And I really do hope to see you in the next one of these free webinars. Thank you and have a great day.